of memory allocation. So first things first, let me go to this whiteboard in the meantime. Dynamic memory allocation. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but just for a quick rundown, there's multiple functions that you would use when it comes to dynamic memory allocation. So that's going to be malloc, it's going to be calloc, and then there's realloc. Yeah. So out of all these three, the ones that you guys should be the most familiar with is malloc out of anything. So malloc in here, you would pass in whatever the size or the amount of uh, bytes you're going to want to uh, allocate. So for example, let's say you want to have an array of size five of five integers. You would take size of int times number five. So that's just a quick overview into malloc. And of course, if you were to do that, you would do, uh, you know, numbers instead of equal like that. So that's just a quick, uh, a quick example of how malloc would work. As for calic, calic, the way I like to remember is it starts with the letter C. So the first thing you pass in is going to be the count of the elements you want. So in this case, you do five and the size of every single thing that we would be adding in would be an integer. So the only difference between calc is it takes, calc and malloc is that it takes in two parameters, one, the number of elements, and the second one would be the size of it. And it would default whatever it is that you, um, like whatever type of thing you pass into it, it would default everything to zero. So this would give you an array of five elements, five integers, that's just all equal to zero. So that's just a quick uh, overview on calic. Typically, you would only use this in certain scenarios when it comes to the foundation exam. So that would be like if you're using a frequency array or let's say um, you, you just, you're just always going to start off something at zero. So then in that case, you would just want to use calic. But generally, you would use malloc. Realloc, though, is something that it probably comes, it might have came up in your class pro, uh, programs when it comes to CS1 or maybe even intro to C. But realloc, what it does, it'll reallocate the number or, or a certain size of array you have or a certain size of memory. So let's say you have an array with two elements, right? So you have index zero, index one. And let's say you want to expand it to make it bigger. If there is space to the right of it, then let's say you wanted to realloc, um, let, let's call this a pointer star. And this is pointing to this array. If you wanted to increase the size of it, so we have a size of two and we want to increase it to a size of five, you would pass in the pointer. So the actual name of the pointer right here. And then from there, you would do whatever the type is. So this would be like size of int times the number or the size you want to allocate it to. In the case that it can find space right next to it, to the right of the last element, then it's just going to extend it. So now you're going to have five, and this is going to return to you like the, the new pointer pretty much. Um, and it, if, if it doesn't find it right immediately right here, what it's going to do is going to try to find another area in memory that has a total of five elements and then it'll like transfer then you're going to have to transfer everything over to that new uh location in the memory so that's just a quick um a quick overview of what typical dynamic memory uh functions are and and how you would use that uh but as of right now we're going to hop into some of the questions that you can come across so it's going to select dynamic memory, and then we'll get started with that. So I'll let you guys have some time to, to read it. I'll, I'll just read it along, but, um, but yeah, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds, and then I'll or a couple of minutes maybe, and then we'll look at the question. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start up on, on this first one in case uh, you guys have, have finished or you guys have like uh, finished reading this. So it says, write a function that takes in a string as its input, creates a new smart string struct, and stores a new copy of that string in the word field of the struct. So it's pretty much saying that we're gonna create a new struct um, that'll create a new copy of the string. So um, it's gonna store it in here. 
and the length of that string in the length member of the struct. Okay, so we're going to store the length in here. The function should then return a pointer to the new smart string struct. Use dynamic memory allocate or dynamic memory management as necessary. The function signature is uh, smart string create smart string character string. Okay, so pretty much what it's saying is what we're going to want to do is we're going to have a string. So let's say we have let's see this. So let's say we have a string shep, right? So we're going to have this string shep in in this character right? it's a size five and pretty much what we're going to want to do we're going to want to store one this string as a new copy it said inside of of a struct so let's say we have the struct right here let's say it's going to be in memory so i'm just drawing out what memory would kind of look like and right around let's say this region you're going to have let's say this address is like 200, for example. So in this region, you're gonna have something that's gonna end up pointing to a copy of what you have right in here. So you would have Jeff, you have a copy of that. And then another thing you're also gonna store is the link. So you guys should remember that this, character right here is not actually considered part of the string in terms of how many characters it has. It just denotes like when you're at the very end of the string. So you would go one, two, three, or you would start like zero, then count one, then you would be at one, count two, three, then count three, then you would be four. And then once you, oh, let me see what's the same. Of course the transcriptions may be name. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, someone just joined. Okay, so there's this is an array of length four. So you would also be storing, for example, right here, you would just be storing memory like, you know, four. So th this would not be a, a pointer necessarily. It would just be like four in here. So you're trying to create a struct, and this all right here is a struct. And um, yeah, essentially, you're just going to have a copy of the string and then the, the length of it. So if we're thinking about how we look in code, let me just copy this over. So can you guys see this uh, well enough or do you guys want me to zoom in? Just uh, let me know in the chat. You can zoom, zoom in, in a bit. Zoom in. Zoom in? All right. That's good. I good? All right. Uh, I got to zoom in on this one. Okay. okay. It's a little too much. Okay, cool. So we're going to want to use what we get passed in here. So for example, first thing we're going to want to do is malloc the actual smart string struct because we're going to be storing stuff in there, but we can't store stuff in there and access like character star word or in length if we haven't even, you know, created it or allocated it. So what we're going to do in this case is do smart string. And let's call this new smart string equals, and then we're going to malloc it. The reason we're not going to want to do calic is because we don't want it defaulted to, to zero. I just want you guys to know that when you use null, like null and zero, they're kind of, uh, you could kind of say this is true. Like this is kind of true. Um, so if you just do use calic in this case, it would default it to zero. So therefore it would be interpreted as kind of null which is not what you want. Uh, so that's why I'm using mallet in size of smart, smart string. So now we have a struct. Um, we've created a struct of this in memory. So that's where we have, uh, oh shoot, I zoomed in. Uh, that's where like we have the in memory, you know, the, the whole box. So now we have, this is where the character star is gonna be. This is where the, you know, like wherever the word is going to be held, and this we're going to be the size, of whatever this is here. So now we're also going to want to allocate 
the field for the word itself because we're going to create a new copy of that string in the word field. But what do you guys think that we have to, to know first before we allocate that? Like the size of it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're going to want to know the size of it. So I'm just going to store a variable because we're going to be uh, calling like the function that'll give you the, the length of it multiple times. So let's call this uh, string length. And then we can call the string length function from the string.h library. And now we have the length of the string. So now we have that. Now we can allocate. We can just access our new smart, no, God, smart string. And now we can go to the word field and we can allocate that as well based on the size of the character. And there's gonna be string length plus one. The reason I'm gonna do the plus one is because you're gonna to wanna to account for the null terminator. So remember that whenever you're doing, whenever you're allocating a string, let's say we wanna add the word Shep, S-H-P-E. This is four, but we're gonna to wanna to have one more for the null terminator. So that then when you're reading the string and when you're printing it, you know that this is the stopping point. Uh, because it's like a special character. So that that's that. So that's why we did the plus one. And now we're going to want to copy things over. So there's a good function uh, called string copy. And then this is going to be your destination on the left. And then this is going to be your source on the right. So in that case, the destination would be new smart string. And this is going to be the word. And then the source is going to be the str itself, like the string itself. So now we've done that. And then now we have the shep in the in, inside of the new field, the word field. And all we're going to want to do at the end is mark string and then add on the length. So it's going to be length and it's going to be string length. So now at this point, we've malloc the actual smart string itself, calculated the length malloc the, the new field so we can copy it over. We copied it over, we set the link. So at this point, we're just done with this first part. And by the way, like uh, in the test, this is probably not gonna take you too long. I'm just going slow so everyone can see like my thought process and, and like how I'm going through it. So uh, yeah, you're just gonna wanna return new smart string. And this is for the first one so far. And now for the second one, let's see what it says. Now write a function that takes a smart pointer, which might be null, as its only argument, and frees all dynamically allocated memory with struct and returns null when it's finished. Okay, so essentially what we're doing is we're going to be freeing all the memory and just deleting the smart string that, that we made. So again, this is the whole, the, the memory box, right, like in, in our computer, we have all this space. And let's say this area right here, is where all the stuff for our smart string is at. Uh, okay, let me just shade this out. So this is where length is at, right? And then this is where the word itself is at. And of course, word uh, points to something else in, in memory, right? So you have your spaces and all that. So before we can actually free, before we can actually free this box right here, this whole, um, like the, the outline box right here, we're gonna want to free what's inside. So we wanna free in this new word struct or this new uh, word character array that we just allocated. Then after that, we're gonna wanna free the actual, the entire memory itself. We won't have to free anything when it comes to the length because it's an integer and it's statically allocated. We didn't have to malloc anything. So a good rule of thumb, after any malloc or any calloc, you have to free. If not, they're taking points off and you know, you're know you gonna lose points. So we're gonna free the word itself inside the struct and then the actual struct itself. And then from there, we're gonna go. So let's, let's do that. So we're just gonna go S, three S word. Then we're just gonna do 
three S, and then at the end they want us to return null, and that's it. So we're just freeing the memory inside. You always have to free the memory inside if there's anything you have to free, and then work your way out outwards so that then um, now you know everything that's dependent on the struct itself has been free. Because if you free the struct first, then you can't access this uh, later on, you know? So that's the whole point. So yeah, so let's see. Uh, malloc, the string, I calculated the string length first. Then I malloc the string itself. So that part was good. I just did a little, a different order, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you copy everything over, return S, and yeah, that's it. So we got that. That's good. That's seven points right there. And in this one, oh, okay, okay. So I didn't read that it said it might be null. So that, that's why they have this here. So let me just add that real quick. So in the case that it is not null, then in that case you're gonna free it because you, you've not, you just can't free something that that is null. So so that's why they do that check. I just, I just read it quickly through it, but uh, yeah. I'm sure it would give you most points. So yeah, like one point for checking uh, for checking that. So that, that was just one point off. So that's nine out of 10, um, yeah. So that's this question. So now we can go on to the next one. Oh wait, uh, let me see what the chat is saying. Don't think you have enough room to write it. Should you also be a null check? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't uh, check that. I didn't read the whole thing. All right, so this one is a catalog of apps and their price is stored in a text file. Each of the lines contains the name of the app followed by its price with the space in between. Write a function called make app array that reads app information from the file and stores it in an array of app pointers. Your function should take in two parameters and point it to the file containing the app information and an integer indicating the number of apps in the file. It should return a pointer to an array of apps and an app is stored in the struct below. So this is what an app looks like right here. So let's just see again the structure of what we're reading in. Each line of the file contains the name of an app. Okay. Followed by a price with a space in between. Okay. So I'll give you guys like a, a minute or two to, to like think about what you should do. And um, and then I'll go ahead and, and go into it. I just wanted to say uh, these type of questions, they're not too common where they have the file pointer. Typically, many teachers, they may not uh, like go through that. There's some teachers that, that they do. Like, for example, I know Gerber is doing that now in this semester. Ahmed, he's been like famous for, for using file pointers in his program. So, so he's a teacher that has always done that. Guha, he typically gives you points off if you actually do, you do that. So, so that's why I'm just saying that you probably won't have to be too familiar with file pointers. If you guys notice, uh, this was from 2017. So, you know, five years ago, but it's, it's good to be familiar with them, but I wouldn't expect it on one of these exams, but still it's good practice. So I'll just, I'll go through it regardless. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. So we're gonna be reading it from a text file and the structure is gonna be a the price, or sorry, the actual name of the app and then the price with a space in between. So yeah, it might be like, um, let's call, let's say Flappy Bird. And then you're gonna have like five, right? So, so this is an example of what it might look like. So we're gonna want to, first of all, let's let's look at what we're getting past. So we get the number of apps. So we know the number of apps up front. 
And then we also have the file pointer. So in these type of problems, they don't necessarily, they're not really stating whether or not you assume the file pointer is open because typically you use this function, you use um, this function called um, F open. And then from there, you can put like the, the name of the file and so on. But one key observation is they don't tell you the name of the file. So by them not telling you the name of the file, which is something you're supposed to specify here, like, you know, text.txt and then maybe it's a reading or whatever. By them not specifying that, you just assume that you don't have to open it. It's already open. So you can just use it and then use uh, whatever function you can use on file pointers, like fscanf, fprintf, and all that sort of stuff. So we're just assuming it's already open because otherwise it just wouldn't make sense. So we have a number of apps. So what I'm going to do is create a for loop. So I like to use X. So I'm sorry if you guys don't, don't like that, but that is, this is how I do it. And we're going to want to create 20, or, or not, or not 20, sorry, I was looking at this. We're going to want to create number of apps, but we're going to want to have that many apps. But notice it's a double pointer. So the whole structure of what it's going to look like in memory is going to be a sort of array. And this is going to point to one struct. This one's going to point to another struct. This one's going to point to another struct and so on until you hit uh, num apps, number of apps you've done. So that's the structure of that. So whenever we have this sort of structure, that's typically when you're gonna see a double star. So that's like a, a double pointer. So we're gonna have one array of pointers, which is gonna be this one right here. And then we're gonna have the pointers that each of those location in the array of pointer is pointing to. So this is something pointing and then it's pointing to something which is like right here. It's gonna be whatever this is. Yeah, it's, it's an array of pointers and they're pointing to something. So that's the structure of it. So we're gonna wanna allocate that first. So let's let's do that. So app, same star. I'm allocate, size of, and then we're gonna do app star. The reason I'm doing app star is because we're making an array of pointers. So the size of an app and then versus the size of an app pointer is two different things. The app pointer is going to be bigger. So that's why I'm doing that times number of apps. So now we have that many uh, pointers in the pointer array. And now from there, we're going to want to iterate through uh, what's actually in the file. So like I said, we're going to have a bunch of these type of entries and we're going to do pretty much the same thing for all of them. So now that we've created the actual array structure, we're going to have something like this. But the thing is, these pointers, this is an array of pointers right here. They're not pointing to anything. So we're going to want to create what they're going to point to before we can start saying, okay, this is the word. This is the price right here. And we're going to want to do that for every single one. So you have to create it before you can access and add stuff into it. Because if not, then how are you going to add stuff into something you haven't created? That's like the whole idea. So let's go back. So first things first, let's do double when we're in the Next equals malik size of the app. And now at this point, we're going to want to have somewhere to store the actual word that we're going to be reading in. And notice how the name array, it, the size is up to 20. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a character array called buffer. So you're just going to read in everything. And uh, yeah, you can read it into this because you're not really going to know whatever the size is up front. So let's do fscanf. 
which is the function where you're going to read and stuff from the file. The first parameter is going to be the actual file pointer itself. The second is going to be kind of like printf or scanner, where you're just taking, you're just defining like what it looks like that you're going to be reading in. So that's going to be percent %d and then a float, which is going to be f. But the thing is, we haven't defined the actual flow. But we don't have to define it because we're just uh, we already allocated it here, and it's statically allocated. It's not like uh, this is also statically allocated. Um, so we can read it into the buffer, and then we can read it into the array. We're gonna want to use the ampersand so we can get the address of it. And then price. So this is one way of doing the actual read-in. You can pass it in through a buffer, but for, for those that, that like noticed it, you might actually not need that because this oh the, the number the time pass fuck shoot. Okay, okay, my bad, my bad. So so what I was saying was uh when you're gonna read stuff in. Since you already had the, the struct itself defined, where it was like a name of 20, you might not even need this. Some people like to do that because it's simpler, so I'll, I'll just do that, but you can just read it in directly. So you could uh, read it straight to the buffer, string copy it from the buffer, which is the source, and string copy it over into the double pointer array. I'm just going to access that by dot. Sorry, uh, let, me, let me do this again. By arrow. And from there, you're going to access the name field. So now we've read in the name and we've read in the for the price. And uh, we copied over the name into like from the buffer that we just read it into. So now at this point we've read in, we've done the iterations after we allocated this, we've read in and defined everything, we mapped everything, copied it over. So now at this point we can just end up returning. So that's going to be the double point array, and then that that should be it. So let me just, uh, let's go back to, the, to what it was saying. Let me just zoom in a little in case anyone's still like trying to work on it and see, let's make sure. So followed by price, taking two parameters, you should return an array sort of that. So yeah, so you're just reading that stuff in. So we did everything that they asked for in here. Malik copied it over and everything. So that, that should be good. So let's see. So yeah. We had to allocate the double pointer rate, number of apps times the size of the pointer, tap pointer, initialize what you're going to be iterating by. We did that here. Then we iterated at every given index. So I, I use X at every given index. You're going to malloc first before you actually add stuff in. And the way they did it, they did two different scan F, but you can just put them both together if, if you like. Uh, like if you know you can do that or if you if you felt like doing that alternatively you can also do it this way where you read it into another one but like i said you don't necessarily have to do that so if if we just if we left it like this we would get full points alternatively you could have just um done it like this since it was statically allocated you could have done just this and that would have also given you full points so they understand that different people might do stuff a different way. So this also works. And then at the end, you just return the app array and that's it. So, so like they say they can order these statements differently, but they have to like allocate everything that they can allocate all the stuff that they're reading in. So yeah, they, they can do it that way as well. So it, it just depends how you do it. But at the end of the day, it's if you understand the process so yeah that's that's 10 points so so far two questions 10 points each 19 so that's pretty good so does anyone have any questions there about price <laughs> zero yeah 
Check your pointers in the mallet for to add star since it's a 2D array. Where at? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant for you. If you meant for this one, yeah, I had had done that. On um, the inside, you don't have to. That's only when you're doing a pointer to a pointer that you would do that. All right, so let's go on to the next question. Okay, so let me let me zoom out a little bit, or let me just uh, close this one down. Zoom in so you guys can see this one. So I'll let you guys start on it or read it for a couple of minutes, and then I'll hop in. By the way, everyone, uh, feel free to like comment on, on what you think I'm supposed to do. Um, like before I started a question, you know, so then you guys can interact a little bit and, you know, like uh, not just hear me do it, you know, <laughs> like just uh, how I'm thinking about it. Okay, so I'm about to start. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, Dylan, I, I did start. I started uh, a while ago, around 7.30, 7.35. Yeah, you're on the right track, uh, Christopher. Yeah, you're on the right track. So let's get, let's get started. Okay, so let's see what they end up giving us. They end up giving us the first name, the last names, the IDs, and N. So let me just read through it. Each of them linked N contain the first name, last name of N employees for some company. The function dynamic allocates an array of N employees and it copies the information pretty much from this, it'll go into the first name of this employee, the last one will go into the last name of that same employee, and same for ID and so on. So we're going to want to return. And one key thing is you guys should always look at the return type when you're doing like DMA or really any type of, of function. Always look at the return time because that'll tell you, uh, especially when they're not telling you just fill in blanks. When they're telling you to actually code something, this is usually a key giveaway of like the type of thing that they're going to want you to do. Uh, so yeah, like if this was double star, it would be a different procedure. I would have to do the same thing as the last question. So I would go through it like that. So let's uh, let, let's go through what they, they were, they had left for us to fill in the blank. So we're going to want to do just what Christopher said. So we're going to want to do size of employee times n. So that's going to be an array of 1D array of employees. So what that's going to look like is we're just going to have one array. And then this right here is employee 0, employee 1, employee 2. So that's a structure. We're not dealing with any arrows outwards and, and all that stuff. That's not what we're doing right here. Just 1D. So now we just created that 1D structure. And now we're going to go into the for loop. And the first fill in the blank is this malloc right here. So array i dot first. Notice how this isn't statically allocated. They're not giving us a predefined size, just like the last question, where it was like character, name, and then 20. So we know if we don't know any size. We don't know what the maximum is going to be that we can put into it. So we know we're going to have to malloc it. And what we're going to malloc it based on is whatever the size is of a given employee based on the character array, first names, last name, and ID. So what I mean by that is, let's say the first employee, his first name is length 10. Then, then in that case, what you're going to want to do is uh, malloc something for that person's name of size 10 and then copy everything over. But in this case, we only care about malloking. So the way that would look like is first names. I'm gonna, oh, sorry, let me do uh, size of character times 
And now we're going to do is take the length. We're going to do string length, string length of first names of X. Or, or sorry, he uses I. He uses I. So first names of X, yeah. And then now we're going to want to do plus one. Same thing because we're going to want to add the, the null terminator. It's basically a little null terminator at the end. So that's that. And as for the last, it's going to be same same exact thing, except we're going to change it to the last name. The string length of last names of i plus one. All right, so that's done right there. So that's probably like a decent number of points right there. And now we just have to free what we allocate. So let's do that. By the way, the reason I'm putting, I have this timer running and the reason like the, on the last question, it just like gave the answer before we were finished was because I set it up to only be 20 minutes. So people like kind of like get in the mode and try to rush themselves to finish everything in 10 minutes, because like you have 12 questions on the foundation exam with 120 minutes. So that's 10 minutes of questions. So you gotta, you know, really be uh, going after it. So that's why it's, it's time that I'm going a little quick on this one. So now that we're going to free it, we're going to see at every struct, what is it that we have inside? We have a first and a last that we allocated. So we're going to want to free those before we free uh, the overall like uh, array itself. So we have a variable n. So we're going to iterate through all n. And uh, what we're going to want to free is just whatever's inside at the given index we're at, so x. And in this case, we're going to do dot. So the reason we're doing dot is because this is a 1D array. And since it's a 1D array, whenever you do an index on a 1D array, it actually dereferences whatever the struct is under, like uh, underneath for you. Because normally, like uh, if it was a pointer, then you would do three x star. This is if it was double pointer, or, or sorry, um, three array x and then the, the arrow. So that was if it was a double pointer. In this case, in this 1D array, array of x, that dereferences it uh, whenever you index. So that like kind of like unlocks the under underlying struct. And then that way you can just do uh, dots on it. So now we're gonna do free dot first. Same thing on array of x. And we're gonna free the last. And um, there's one last thing we have to free. So we just freed everything in the array. So we just freed, so we had this like this. This is um, last, 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 first, 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 first. So we just free this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. So now the only thing left to free is the actual array itself, you know, because uh, even though you freed all the memory inside, there's still certain things in, inside of it that have not been uh, properly like uh, deleted out of memory. For example, uh, like, you know, the, the integers and stuff, you don't free those yourself, but they end up getting like uh, recycled, if that makes sense. Oh, shoot. Well, there it goes. So, yeah, all, all I was saying was just that you have to free the array, and then that was it. So, let's see. Let's see what happens. So, size of employee times n. And let's see. The following blanks are worth two points each. Avoid one person, one point if close. Okay. So, let's see. Size of array of character times string link. First name of i plus one. That's good. Same thing for the last names plus one, that's good. So that's one plus four, that's five. And now let's see the rest. Oh, so this right here, you didn't have to do it here. Um, like I, I just declared mine here, so they wouldn't take points off for that either. So let's say one point, we got that one point. We looping correctly, are we? Yes, we are. So that's another point, that's two three, four, and then we got five. So that's 10 out of 10 right there. So yeah, I hope you guys like see like these dynamic memory allocations are typically not that bad. It's just 
knowing the little like uh, details, like for example, that thing that I mentioned where you're doing arrow or when you're doing dot, that's something that trips up a lot of people. And actually in the exam that I did, the foundation that I did was, it had one question and it was like probably like the worst thing, like the trickiest one. They had a part of it where you were doing arrows. So it was like, it was like an array and then you would have like um, sub something. I don't know that I'm just making up the, the actual, like these names, but it was something like this. And then you had to do a dot to get the length and, and all that stuff. So it, it was kind of, it was kind of uh, tricky, but um, yeah, normally they're not that bad. They're typically simple. We're just allocating and um, they try to get you on little things like doing plus one for strings and all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, but these questions aren't, aren't that bad. You guys should be very familiar with it. So I'm just going to do one more question. So, so we don't like uh, spend too much time on this uh, and then we'll, we'll go on to link lists. All right, so timer started. I'll check back in around 7.30 on the, on the clock right here. So I'll give you guys a minute or two so you guys can figure it out. Okay, 7.30. So let's get into it. So they give you this code and then you're trying to figure out where there's a memory leak. So on these type of things, you have to go line by line and do every step. Uh, unless like, you know, you're like, a, you're pretty good with this stuff and so on. So let's, let's trace it out. So they give you two strings. So they give you one and then two. So let me just make it like string one equals, and then let's just say we have an empty space right here. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, for sure. It, it, it says that we only have to care about those, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just like making uh, people see like, like the whole structure of everything. How it's, how it's like, so. They're going to add in pass into it. So P, A, S, S, and then it's going to be null terminator. So it's kind of like the structure of it. They tell you to print it. So they're going to print it. We're, I'm not going to do that. Then line 14. So we care about line 14, like, uh, like Dylan said. So at line 14, let's see what happens. So right now, before this line, everything was fine. String one was pointing to whatever string one was allocated to. String two was pointing to whatever string two was allocated to. But what ended up happening was, so we had pass, and then all the space to the right. And we had another one where that just literally had nothing. So string one, string two. So now what it did is that it set I believe string two to point to string one. So what's going to happen is we're going to reroute. Uh, it, it doesn't matter which error one it happened to, but it's just going to reroute one to point to the other. And the problem with that is by rerouting what one of these two is pointing to, you're going to lose whatever uh, memory was allocated at the thing that I was pointing to before the reassignment. So for example, String two used to be pointing to where it was pointing to this one right here. This is in the memory. But then after you reassign it, then now you're going to lose this link right here. And by losing that link, you're not going to be able to access it unless you like store a variable or something. But in our code, they didn't do that. They just reassigned it. And then now this link is lost. So this is where the memory leak happens. So it says line 14, string two equals string one. So let's see, draw a picture that indicates the relevant state of the memory. Yeah, so what, what I just had, had drawn out was, was what it was. So yeah, we just had two, two things, string one, string two, and uh, yeah, just like this. So that's pretty much what it was. 
So that's uh, three points right there. Then explain why line 14 causes a memory leak. So the reason it causes a memory leak I already explained, you just lose uh, a point or two what you were previously uh, like pointing to and now you can't free that. So you've leaked those 16 uh, bytes for, for the character. And now it, why is it possible to for the code to crash on line 21? Exactly, you're, you're freeing a null pointer because you ended up freeing it here. And whenever you free, it sets it to be null or like kind of like, like garbage sometimes. It, it kind of depends, but typically it's like null or garbage. Um, and then you can't free that. So by this having been pointed to something that was already freed and trying to free it again, you're going to run into like a, a segfault problem. So that, that's why that would be the case. So let's go on to it. Exactly, double free error. Yeah, so this is the same exact thing. So that's why I wanted to uh, to like draw it out so you guys can see and go through it like step by step. Okay, so mm -hmm, same exact reasoning. Lose what it was going to. Okay, so that's it, no half points. So yeah, you gotta be exact with this stuff. Explain why. And by the way, in this question, they tell you to draw a picture to like visualize what it looks like. I always tell people, I've always told this when they're like studying for their, for their tests, uh, especially like this last one that I did the, the sessions for, even if they don't tell you to draw something out, draw it out. Like for example, link list, binary tree, tries, all this stuff, all this stuff is way easier to think about and do if you have a picture. But if you're just trying to like do it all in your head and just thinking about the code in your head, unless you like have a lot of experience, it's going to be pretty hard to end up doing that. So in questions, even though they might not ask you to do this right here, this is a good practice. And um, yeah, that's actually uh, good to talk about now that we're gonna go into linked list. So that was that was dynamic memory allocation. Just did a couple of questions because I'm sure everyone's familiar with it. So yeah, let's um let's go on and do uh let's go into linked list. And I'm just gonna save all of this right here in case anyone anyone wants it. So. Okay. All right, so this is the first linked list question. So let's start. Okay, timer's up. So around 7.30, I'll come back. So you guys give it a read and, and try it out and let me know what you guys think before I come back. Okay, 7.30. All right, so pretty much they're asking you to Take a string and are we directing you to get a linked list and then turn it into a, a string? So let, let's just read through. Write a C function that takes in a pointer to a linked list storing a string and returns a pointer to a traditional C string with the same contents. Make sure to dynamically allocate, null terminate, and assume that the function length already exists. So then you can. Okay, so pretty much they give you a function so you can just call and you don't have to iterate through the linked list yourself. So we're gonna wanna return a character array. So just a string of, of uh, you know, regular C string. Let me just copy this down. All right, so whenever we're gonna want to dynamically allocate a character array or really anything, you're gonna wanna know what the size of it is gonna be. So right now we have no information on the size. So I can just go ahead and do return string equals malloc of size of character times something because I, I don't know how big it's gonna be. So the length of our string is going to be determined by whatever we get from the length function or you know if we do it ourselves but they give us a length function for the linked list so the structure we're working with is like you know something like this let's say we have high 
then this is this function is going to return back two because there's two nodes and then you hit null and it's going to return zero. So yeah, there's size of two. So that's that way we can use that to know how long it is like our string is going to end up being. Oh, sorry, <laughs> not string like sorry, uh, like uh, yeah. So I'm going to do length, string length. And we're going to want to add the null terminator. They tell us the null terminator, and you always do that when it comes to strings. So we have our character array to the proper size. And uh, one thing we can do right now, just to get it out the way, is null terminated. So if we have a string of length 2, that means that our null terminator would have to be at index 2, because uh, let's say we have Again, hi. This is index zero, this is one, and then this is two. So we'll just index into return string of whatever the string length is. And that'll end up being the location where the null terminator is going to be. So that'll do the trick right there. So now we have a null terminated. So what we're working with right now is the array of whatever size. And then we just have this right now. So now we have to actually put in the letters into where they're supposed to go. So what we have to be able to do that is we have the head. So we can set a temporary pointer to the head. Let's call this uh, temp. I usually call them like just C or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, thought temp. And now the idea is we're going to want to go through the linked list and take every letter in it and place it into the character array based on whatever uh, index we're at. So, for example, we have array. So let's say we have a linked list. Uh, Shep it says Shep inside. We're gonna wanna have some sort of way to be able to index and place in, in here, you're gonna place your S. In here, you're gonna place in your H, P, and then same thing with, with your E. Hurt, that's not E, it's a P, so E. So we're just gonna wanna transfer stuff over uh, based on whatever index we're at. And that's pretty simple to do. All you have to do is just store a number on the outside. So that then while you're iterating through the linked list with your 10 pointer, you can just index in and then increment it as you go. So we can iterate while well, 10 does not equal null because null is going to be the end of the linked list. What we can do is set return string of x equal to temp of letter. So whatever letter is at the current node that we're at, we're going to place that into the index we're at that represents like what node in the linked list we're at, if that makes sense. So like I said, if you're trying to copy over a linked list that says Shep into a character array, index one, which represents the second letter, meaning the H in Shep, you're going to put that into index one of the uh, character array. Then at that point you can just increment so x plus plus. Also, if you if you just put your x plus plus here, they wouldn't take points off. But let's just do it like this. So uh, in case anyone doesn't like that syntax, so temp equals temp dash next. So that'll have you iterating through the rest of the linked list. So you pretty much take the letter, place it where you have to, move on 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 both the index and the actual node. And then from there, you, you're you gonna go through that whole linked list. And now you've already seeded the, the null terminator, so you don't have to worry about that. And then you can just return the return string. And that's it. So I'm, I'm sure in their solution, they probably did this at the end, but it doesn't matter the order you do it in. It'll, it'll be the same. So let's see, let's see what the solution is. Okay, so you find the length. So we did that. 
that's one. Allocate the space, we did that, that's two. The index, same exact thing, we did that right here. And notice how they didn't do a uh, node start temp. So they didn't set a temp variable. Me personally, I like to, to do that. In this type of problem, I wouldn't have, but the reason I didn't do it in this problem, or I did in this problem is just in case like uh, anyone's used to doing that. But it's a good practice because there are certain problems that once you move, like if you just use head and you don't use a temporary, once you move the head, you might want to use it again after you go through through this loop. So for example, if I did this right here, if I, at the start of a function, I had a, a pointer, so this is head, and it's pointing to like uh, a link list, right? X is just long, so we have a link list. If I decide to use this as my iterator, so head is gonna start here and then head is gonna end up, you know, like moving here and then downwards and so on. Then if I have to go backwards, I'll lose track of that unless I store something. So there's certain problems that you have to keep that because you have to do something else. In this specific problem, you only need to go through the linked list once. So that's why they didn't care about setting a temporary point. But meanwhile, if you use a temporary, a temporary pointer in certain problems, you won't run into the issue of moving head and then losing the head. It would be the same exact thing as the, the, the memory leak on the string question that we did. So that's my whole reasoning behind doing this. It's just a good practice for most problems. But in this problem specifically, you didn't have to do that. Um, you want to get points off either way. So yeah, res link, uh, no terminator, and then you return. So yeah, we got all that. So let's see. So you said, how come you put return string before you loop again? It doesn't matter. It is just a style choice. You can do it afterwards because at the end of the day, um, I'm just go up here. So all I'm doing, I have this array. And I'm just placing this here. It doesn't matter if I place this null terminator here uh, because either way, let's say I have a link list as H to P to E to, again, this is null, so I'll do it big. So let's have a variable. Uh, okay, let's do something else, let's call it U. So you is what I'm going to iterate through with. So when you're going to, I'm just going to do a, a circle. So we're going to be here, right? So we're going to place, this is just like if we're doing it afterwards. So we're going to place S into index zero. So we're going to do like a, the, the string index of U. So that's going to be S. We're going to place that in there. Then we're going to increment it to one. Now we're going to be right here. We're going to, uh, index in and set uh, the string of u, so the string one, the index one, which is going to be the second one, set it to h. And then I'm going to, I'm just going to do this process. So I'll go to two, uh, place it in, and I'm going to, okay, that's, it's not a <laughs> three. And now what's going to happen is we're going to go e. So we would have been here, we would have placed it. And now we would be at four, but then we're gonna get here because we ended up moving. And now it's gonna be you null. Know, so you you would just stop at this point. So you can either just literally do the string. This is after the loop. You can either do like string of u or whatever variable and set that equal to the character. But if you notice, you also have uh, whatever this final thing is going to be based on the string length. So the string length of this is four. So you can just index into the whole string length before the while loop and just uh, place it in there. Or you can use the string length you calculated before, after the while loop. Or again, you can use the U variable itself because they're all going to end up at the same index. So it doesn't matter where you put it because it's never you're never gonna run into this in the while loop. So that's the whole thing. It's just gonna stop off at this point. And then you can either use this variable to put it in here or you can um, use the string length before or after. It just doesn't matter. So that's the whole reason. Yeah, you can move this. 
here, here. And uh, like I said, you can do X because this will be at, at the length since it would stop there. And yeah, you're, you're still all good. So that's that question. All right, so I'll, I'll move on to the next. Oh boy, <laughs> I remember this. Okay, yeah. This one, I'll give you guys until until seven, not at seven thirty this time, because this one's a little, this one's a little annoying. Oh, sorry. Okay, so it's five uh, five thirty. So let's let's get started. Into it. give me one second. Okay, so I'm gonna do this in this whiteboard. So this is what we're working with right now. And let me just uh, split screen it. So this is what we're working with. I'll do like the edits and stuff in in orange. So we're gonna start off at the top of this function. And by the way, yeah, I know this 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 is bad. This is bad. It looks bad. So. Let's just go through it step by step with the ifs. So if head is null, we pass in this, this is the head. So it's not null, so we're good there. Then if head next is not equal null, so the next of this is not null, so that's fine. And head next data, so the next data, so 27 mod two equals equals zero. That's saying it's even. So 27 is not even, so we would go on to the next else if, because you know this broke it. So now we're going to go to the else if, if head next is not equal null, then we're going to do head next equals funky of head next. So that means we're going to iterate. So whenever we find something that's odd, we're just going to move on to the next one, essentially. So it's going to be the same thing. So now we were here. And now we're going to end up being here. And now at 27, we're going to do the, the same kind of thing, but we're going to see. So head next is not equal null, so it doesn't equal null. But head next data is even. So at 27, we're going to look at 20, at uh, 84, and we're going to see, okay, it's even. So now we're going to be in this area right here. So now we're going to see head next. So head next, let's say next equals whatever that function returns. So I'll just call it function y. And we're going to pass in the head next next and then head next. So the current head right now is 27. And the head next next is going to be the next next, therefore 50. No, 50. And then we're going to have uh, the next of 27, which is 84. So that's going to be the second parameter. And if we look at it, uh, N1 is going to be the left one. So this is N1. This is N2. So this is going to be. Uh, N2 is going to be N1. So let's see what it ends up doing. So we're going to be right here, and we're going to apply what it says. So N2 next is going to be equal to N1 next next. So 84's next is going to be equal to the next next. So next next of 50. So that means we're going to reroute the next. So we're going to delete this link and set its next to point to whatever the next next is of that one. So it's going to be 32. So this is what we have after this line right here. Now, N1 next is going to be equal to N2. So N1 is currently at node 50. And we're going to set the next of that one equal to N2. So that means we're going to reroute this point it back to here. So this is what we have right now. And then we're going to return n1. So that means at the function, like right here, we're going to set, we're going to come back here. And this function just returned. So it's going to returns n1, which n1, again, is going to be node 50. So just make sure we did that right. 
N2 is next is going to point to the next, next of N1. So next, next, so point it. And then N1 next is going to point to old N2. Okay, so we're good. So now we're going to set the next of 27 to be equal to what the Y, the whatever that says, whatever that returns. So it returns 50. So we're going to set the next of 27 to point to 50. So now that's going to look like this. So I'm going to delete this. I'm going to point it to this one right here. And now we're going to do head equals funky of head next next. So that means we're going to set whatever the head is in this right here is going to be equal to whatever that is. So we're going to want to go down. So we're going to say right here, head is now going to equal whatever that returns. So it's going to be, let's call this F. So head next next is going to be where we at, so 27, the next next is going to be 84. So F of 84. So let's see what that does. So now we're going to go back to 84. And now we're going to look at the next of 84. Now we're going to come back into the recursive call, funky. Oh, well, okay. It just, it finished, but we're still good. We're still good. Uh, it's not showing an answer. So let's keep going a little bit. So... Yeah, we're going to be at node 84, and we're going to see, okay, so it's head null. So 84 is not null. Then if head next does not equal null, so the next of 84 is not null, and head next data mod 2 equals equals uh, equals equals 0. So it does, equal, it, it does equal 0 because this is even. Then in that case, we're going to do the same thing. So now we're going to apply the same exact thing to this right here. So let's see what ends up happening. So this is a structure we have now. So ignore this thing I drew right here. This is just like referencing what's going to happen uh, when we come back. Because like throughout the recursion, you might kind of like lose track of what's happening. There's like so many like things going on. So yeah, like I said, we are right here at this point. And uh, we're going to be doing the same operation. So the next of 84 is going to be equal to whatever the y is of so function y. So next equals function y of head next next. So head next next is going to be 84. Let's follow the path. The next is 32, but the next of the next is going to be null. So 84 is the head next and then next. So we're going to be at null. So we just have a null. And I hope you guys are going to see what's what's the problem with that. And then we're going to pass in head next. So head next is 32. So the issue we run into is now we're in the this this function, the function y. And we're going to do n2 next uh, is equal to n1 next next. But the problem is this is n1 and this is n2. n1 is null. So that means n1 has no next. It has nothing you can access. It has nothing you can arrow in. It has nothing you can do. It's just a null. So that's one of the key things of the, of the question. It says this program is going to crash spectacularly. So, But before it does, it will change the structure of the linked list for a bit. So that's what we're after. So let me just redraw what we have so far, because right here is just gonna kill the program pretty much. It's gonna, just gonna psych fall. So let's redraw the underlying structure we have. Um, and I hope like you guys have been able to follow that because it's a little confusing. Let me see what you guys are saying in the chat. Wait, isn't it n to max? Is funky backwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's like funky, but written in reverse. So it's like, yeah, I, I'm just not even going to pronounce it, but yeah, that's pretty much what it is. So the structure now is going to be pointing to 50. 50 is going to point to 84. Then 84 is just going to point to 32. And then uh, no. So let's see what, uh, what ends up coming up out of it. Yep, exactly that. So 31. And yeah, I just I just redrew like uh, 
I, I kind of like removed the nodes that aren't part of it anymore. So for example, he, he left 40 in there, but um, since they, they, uh, they drew this all out and they, I guess they wanted you to show like everything for, for like every single thing, even if it's not connected to the main, like from the head, you can reach and so on, but you can just look at this link list and it follows the same exact structure. So 31 points to 27, 27 is going to point to 50. So that's good. 50 is going to point to 84. Then 84 is going to point to 32. And um, yeah, 32 ends up pointing to null, but they just didn't like draw it out here. And 40, it has nothing going into it because that's why we, we like cut this link off because we reassigned it to point to 84, but 40 still points to 32. So that is pretty much how this, this question works out. This is something that you have to be able to like uh, save stuff, like save little information here and there, because if not, then, you know, like th this was one uh, question where, where we had to use the second function once. And then luckily enough, right after that one, then we were able to see it. But we didn't have to go through the recursion and come back to like handle how it really would have ended up, uh, you know, processing everything since it crashes. But for example, little things like what I did right here, saving what it would be equal to, because then uh, in my head, I would have to go go back and, and see if I can kind of like remember and go based off the code and so on. Um, and since the link list is changing, it's kind of hard to remember what things used to be when they're changing uh, through throughout the function calls. So that's why like I drew, I wrote out all this stuff here. I wrote this, I wrote this. So this is something that I recommend you guys to, to do like scratch stuff out, add in notes for when you go back to it. Cause you don't know if you'll need it until you're actually like, you know, doing it. So that can save you a lot of time uh, for, for the future. So yeah, that's um that's that question. That was five, five points. Uh, some people think it should be worth more, but yeah, it's five points. So let's go on to the next one. Hope you guys got that. Okay, so next one. Let's see, just another five pointer. So I'll give you guys until about uh, same time. So about like seven thirty, seven forty five. This this one's gonna be pretty pretty short, I think. Okay, seven thirty. So let's trace this out. Let's see uh what it does. So they give you a link list and saying uh yeah, this function is defined from six to fourteen. They're trying to figure out what it does. So is this function recursive? I hope everyone got that right. Cause yeah, calls itself. So easy one point. And then it's asking. What does the function e function do in general to the list pointed by the formal parameter a node? So that's what we're here to figure out. So let's draw a little example. So let's say one, let's just do like five, six, seven, eight, then nine. For these type of things, I like you guys should keep things small. Like there was one question, I don't know if you guys have done it, but it's like a stack and queue question where you're like adding stuff to a stack, pulling it out of one, throwing it in another and all this stuff. They give you like 10 numbers to try to do this with to figure out like what the function does. But one thing I had done was I just cut out like six of the numbers. I just kept three numbers to see what it does on three of them because code it'll do the same exact thing on three of them. Like if it's just like a regular, like a simple type of code, like a just for loop and stuff, no recursion, it'll do the same thing on all three of them that it'll do on all nine of them, you know? So uh, for the most part. So th that's like what I recommend. So I'm just choosing a small example. You don't need to choose a big example. So if a node is null, so let's say this is a node right here. It's not null, so we're not gonna return anything. Then if a node next, equals equals null. So next is not equal null. So that's not the case, so we're good. So now we're gonna move on here. So now we're gonna have this function rest. 
and it's like the, the rest of the link list. So we're going to recurse. So now we're going to be here and now we're going to move down to here. So rest is equaling whatever this call is going to return. And by the way, if you guys are like not that great with recursion, I recommend you guys to like uh, draw like where you're at in the recursion. So this is kind of like how I tell people to do it if they're going to do it. So at this point, you're here. Now we're in this part of the link list. So recursively, this is the call we're at. Then now we're going to do the same thing. Is a node, is it null? It's not null. Is the next of it null? This is not null. So we're good there. Now we can go to line 10, rest. So now we're going to recurse again. So now we're over here. And I'm just going to do this pretty much until we hit either one of the base cases at seven or eight. Either the node is null or the next node is null. So I'm just going to move on. And here is where we have a base case. So the base case would be line eight, which this would be our A node, nine would be our A node. And then um, the next would be null. And since the next is null, that's where you're going to return A node. So like I said, nine would be A node. So now you're going to return not the node containing nine back to the previous function that just called because remember a cursive function calling itself. So now we're going to return this node back to, let's just do it like this. We're going to return this one back to this cursive call right here. Right. So now I'm going to like make it seem like we just left this recursive call. So this is like uh, what it's returning. So return nine back as rest. The node containing nine. And now we're going to go to a node next, next, and set it equal to an a node. So now that we return back, now we're back in this level of the recursion, right? So we're at node eight. This is where we're at right now. So at node eight, we're going to see what the next next is. So next is nine. And then the next of that node is going to be uh, null. So we're going to set this to actually point to a node. So instead of pointing to what it currently does, we're going to point this back to a node. And so we just did line 11. And now we're going to set the next of a node to be equal to null. So now we're going to set this right here. We're going to remove this link. And now we're going to point it to null. OK, so pretty much. Um, and now here we're going to return rest. So what it's going to end up doing is we're going to be returning nine at this point because remember rest was nine that was returned from the previous call so we return nine save it to rest we set the next of this one the next of this one's this like that next pointing to the current node we're at and then we're going to cut it off by setting it equal to null so now we have nine points to eight which points to null and uh, we're, we're going to keep on going so now we're going to return rest so rest is now going to be in this call when we come back from the recursive uh this recursive call when this one's done we're going to end up returning this node to this recursive state right here so it's going to be the uh, rest so it's going to be nine so now we're going to have nine is pointing to eight and then seven and then, uh, yeah, eight is pointing to null. And now here we're going to have a node, which is going to be your a node. Next, next is going to be equal to a node. So now we're going to set the next, next, which is going to be uh, the next of this one, eight. So next, next. This is going to be equal to eight because seven is still pointing to eight, but then eight next is going to be null. So what's going to end up happening is it is going to point back to this one right here. Instead of pointing to, to null, it's going to end up pointing back to seven. 
And then we're going to set a node next to be equal to null. So now this is not going to be pointing back to eight. It's going to be pointing to null. So I hope you guys kind of see what's happening is you're going to be, you're going to be like reversing a small portion of it, which is kind of what happened. So now nine is going to be kind of like the, the front of, of these two. So when we did these two right here, you had nine and then nine is not pointing to eight and eight is pointing to null. Now it's going to come back and then, oh, well, <laughs> it, it just, it just finished. But, but yeah, I was just explaining that. So it's pretty much reversing it where it went from nine to eight. And then now um, it would be seven and then it would do the same thing for six and then five. So it's just reversing the, the list. So reverse the list and it's saying what important task does line 12 perform? So line 12 is the part that was removing the link to what it was previously set at because it, the whole point would be like, then it would be, you, you might be iterating endlessly since you're like uh, linking everything back together, you might end up iterating uh, endlessly. And like you don't want to end up doing that once you go back to use a link list later on, you might end up like creating a cycle by accident. So that's like the whole point of doing this step because that's going to make you to stop at this point and then be able to keep on, on reversing it and just only looking at what you used to be connected to. So like, for example, what seven used to be connected to was eight. It removes that link. So then you can keep on, on reversing as you go backwards and you don't like create any issues later on. So like they, that's the whole thing. So yeah, you can detect the end of the link list since you're, uh, reversing. Most of these details are necessary. So line that sets the next pointer to the resulting list of null. Yeah. So you don't want to create any issues. So that's why you set it to null. So move on. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Zane, for going on to the intro foundation. So I'm going to head off. Okay, cool. No problem. Can we look at algorithm analysis? So I'm going to be doing that not not now i'm going to be doing that um in a couple of sessions because right now i'm only focusing dma link list and then uh, stacks and queues i know i'm running a little late on time typically on the on the first session i try to see like like how things are going and how like people are so i go a little slower but um i'm gonna stay here for a little while so i'll stay here i'll probably extend it up until 10 so we can squeeze in some stacks and queues i'll do one more question of, of link lists and then uh we'll we'll move on um uh, in case like uh you know so we can squeeze everything in even though i'm a little late but all right so i'll just do this one with you guys so write a recursive function above threshold that takes in a pointer to the front of a link list storing integers and an integer limit and returns the number of values stored in the linked list that are strictly greater than limits. So strictly greater. We're only looking if this is the case. So that's it. Strictly greater. And returns the, yeah. So for example, if the function was calling on this linked list, and the limit was eight. Let's see how many things are only greater than eight, or than six, sorry. One, two, three four, five. Yeah. So the function returned five since the second, third, and yeah, all of those are strictly greater than six. We don't count the fourth element. Yeah. So we don't count six because six is not greater than six. It's equal. So they give you the type depth and they give you the function prototype and that's it. So for the most part, you guys shouldn't be like too scared about linked list problems. I think uh, unless you know, there's some that are a little bit harder, like if they integrate link and they integrate on um, queues or stacks and stuff like that. But the ones that are labeled linked lists, typically they're not too bad. They might be a little tedious sometimes, like uh, tracing out. But um, when it's these type of questions where you're like writing most of the code, they're they're pretty much like uh, like pretty easy to know. You just have to like think of the structure. So you have to do it recursively. So let's think about how this is going to work. You're just going to be going through the linked list. So I'm not going to put in values in here. You're going to be going through the linked list. And you're going to see, as you iterate through it, 
you're going to want to track and see like if something is greater than it, only greater. So let's say this is greater than we would add a one and you would keep on going. And if this one's uh, lesser than, you wouldn't add anything. So, you know, you can count that as zero. So you, you would only for this, this example, you would only have added, uh, you would only have one that was strictly greater. So as you go through, you're going to want to add one. Um, and since you're doing recursion, really, you can do that as you're going down the list or as you're coming back up. Because remember, when you're doing recursion, you have the different levels. And as you complete like everything, like every function, everything in the function, you're going to come back up, up, up the levels. And then, you know, you can add it on the way up. So there's two times you can do it. It doesn't matter when you do it. Um, but yeah, that's that. So first of all, recursive function, easy way to get points is doing a base case. So if front equals equals null, you're gonna return zero, right? So we're gonna return zero. So that's a quick way to get a base case uh, points for that. And now we're gonna want to recurse through it. So, Recurse. So let's do int ref equals above threshold front next and then limit. So now what you can do at this point is you can also store like whether or not the current value you're at is greater than or yeah, yeah it's just greater than um you know your limit. So what I how I would do it or I would do it a little differently, but um, how most people would do it is you can have a variable like is above, and you can store like a, a Boolean variable where it's like front data is greater than limits. So if this is true, it'll return to you a one. If this is false, it'll return to you a zero. So that means the value at is above is only going to be one or zero. So you can use whatever this returns as the your counter. So a lot of people they, they might do like um in count equals zero if front net or front data is greater than limit count plus plus or count plus equals one or however you feel like doing it. This also works, but then you would have to like you would remove is above and then you would just do like um return rec plus count. So that also works, that's perfectly fine. Me personally, I think this is kind of like, you, you don't need to do that. Um, this kind of does the same thing. So you can store if it is above and like that's gonna be one or zero for every node, you're gonna have a one or zero. Is it like, does it count? Is it does not count? Is it count? Does it not count? So that way you can just do return is above plus rec. And that way you can you can be done with the question. So that, that's one way to write it. Um, another way you can write it as well would be doing something like this right here. You can condense it a little, but um, yeah, most people probably would not do this. So this is the same exact thing that I was telling you guys. So this is just gonna store whatever the value is, if this is true, one, or if it's false, it's zero, plus whatever the recursion is. So it does the same thing, but you don't have to store a variable. And you still get full points for it. But any way you feel like doing it is fine. It, it doesn't matter, you still get the points. So it's all, it's all up to you. You just have to be able to store or somehow keep track of whether or not that node qualifies, like being greater than the limit. And um, yeah, and then that's about it. So if front is greater than, uh, or sorry, if front is equal to equal to null, return zero. So data counts, and that's fine. So if front data greater than limit, count equals one, and uh, count plus above threshold front next limit. So that's the same thing. So count, you can think of it exactly of this. So that's why, like, uh, I like to do it that way. Yeah, do it however you want. 
So that's five, that's 10 points actually right there. So if you guys can get like these type of questions, like uh, the, the simpler like link list one, like that's the easy 10 points right there. You know, so, so as long as you get those basic concepts, that's like 10 points. You get, you get the DMA, that's five to 10 points depending on the question. So you're looking at 15 to 20 that you can probably like uh, assume you can get, you know, so, so that's good. All right, so this is the last link list one. I'm going to move on to stacks and queues for right now. All right. Oh, boy. Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to do the uh, the coding questions, but I'll, I'll definitely cover this uh, next time because, uh, yeah, it's it's been kind of a while since I've... Uh, since I've done that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cover the like the these type of stuff, the actual uh infix and stuff. I'll do that later on. So I'll skip this one for now. Okay, so we can we can start on this one. So I'll let you guys read it and uh then we can we can do it. First off, let me let me just explain real quick. The concept of stack for those that might not know or you might need a refresher a stack is last in first out data structure so think about a stack of plates or think about like uh if you're at a, at a actually yeah yeah just a stack of plates is fine or when your teacher goes to grade your test if you give him your test last, that means it's going to be at the top of the stack. So then when he pops it off or when he goes to like grade it, then you're going to be the first person who's going to have the test grade. And then you can go and ask him like, oh, what did I get since you knew you were one of the last people? So that's kind of like the whole property of it. And there's some simple operations. There's push, there's pop. So that would be push would be adding something on. Pop would be removing it. There's peak where you just want to see what's at the top of it. So let me see what this element, like just let me take a look at it. Um, so yeah, th those are pretty much like the, the basic operation, push, pop, peak, and so on. Yeah, there, there you go. Okay, so consider a string mathematical expression can have two kinds of parentheses, uh, parentheses or squiggly bracket, then our braces, so it's called. Parentheses in expression can be imbalanced if they're not closed in the correct order or if there's an extra starting or closing parentheses. So let's see, an imbalance, yeah, it's pretty much like if, if it's enveloped and it's like, you know like properly uh balanced so for every given opening you have a given closing like especially in the right place so in this one you have an extra opening so there's like no closing and in this one same thing there's an extra closing but it doesn't have a corresponding opening and this one's perfectly balanced so Write a function that will take an expression in the parameter and returns one if the expression is balanced, otherwise return zero. You have to use stack operations during this process. Assume the following stack definitions are given to you and are they already available to you. You may assume that the stack has enough storage to carry out the desired operation without checking. Okay, so they give you these functions and you're pretty much assuming it works perfectly fine and you're not thinking about what it does. Uh, I'll underline like the code for every single function. You're just assuming it works as intended. So let's see. Initializes, pushes a value on, returns one if empty, otherwise zero. Pops a return character top of the stack and returns character top of the stack. Okay. So precondition E only contains the characters opening, parentheses, closing, opening, squiggly, closing. So we have an integer returning if it's balanced or not, and we have the expression string, and they already initialized these things right here. So the struct stack, and then they initialize the actual stack itself. So let me just copy this over. 
because this is one of those that it's going to take a, a little longer to go through. I already know. So yeah, let me just uh, pull this off. All right, so let me just draw what it is that we're going to be, the, the thing we have to think about. So you're going to give us an expression. Let's say our expression is, well, let's do an open. Let's say we have this expression. So one, two, three. So we know it's unbalanced, but let's see how we're going to verify that. And also let's do another one where it's balanced. Also, um, this one would be a valid valid uh, balance expression. So we're going to have to use a stack. So last in, first out properties. So how can we use last in, first out properties? So let's think about it. Let's start adding on some of the stuff onto the stack and see where it is that it might become relevant. So let's do this string right here, the one that's already that we already know is good. So we're going to add on the opening. So that's one. Then we're going to add on the next opening, right? Let's add on the next one. But let's think about it. Why would I add on a closing in at this point? Like uh, Because then when I go to add on the next thing, I'm not going to necessarily be able to match because the way the stack works, it'll give you whatever's at the top, but it, you won't really be able to see like what's further on below because he just doesn't give you, I believe he doesn't give you, or he, he does give you access to be able to do that, but that's not the intended thing. They want you to use the functions to interact with it. So you're assuming that you're not going to be accessing whatever the struct stack is underlying. Like, they, I don't even think they define it for you. Like, they don't even tell you what's in it. Yeah, they don't. So you have no way to access it directly to be able to see, okay, if I have this, can I check what's further down here? So we're going to have to check as we're entering stuff in. So that, that's like kind of the intuition. So when we're adding, we added this opening in, but then once we're going to add this closing squiggly, one thing we should think about is what is at the top of the stack. So before adding this on, we saw that we had an opening of the same exact type. So when I say type, I mean these two. So these are two types. So if I have a corresponding opening at the top, then you can kind of like uh, close, close that off. So for example, you can say, okay, this sub, this like sub uh, expression is balanced. So even though we have this whole full thing, we can just say that if we like uh, just pull it out, this itself is balanced right here because we have an opening and a closing. So that's good. So that's why you would be removing that from the stack. Because the whole idea is to keep account of what we can balance and pulling things out of the stack um, and not having to add them in when, when we don't have to. Because all we have access to is the top and what we're gonna be adding on. So in this case, if we see that they're corresponding matching, we just don't push this one on. We just pop what was off here. So now we're gonna just remove what, what we have there. So now we're gonna be back at this stage. So we just processed, we added this one, we added this one. We saw this one, so now we popped off this one and we didn't add this one right here. So now we're gonna go on to the next uh, element or like the next uh, character. And we're going to have a closing, but we're going to check before we add it on. Let's see what is at the top of the stack, and let's compare it to what I'm going to be adding on. So by me doing that, then I can see, oh, there. Okay, yeah, so it just, it just finished, but um, yeah, you can't see it. So we're going to see, okay, it's, it's corresponding, so it's the same exact type, and uh, we, we have an opening of the same type, and we're going to be adding on, or we we're looking to add on a closing of the same type. So in that case, what you're gonna do is just pop off the opening from the stack. And notice that if you do that, you, you would have gone through the whole expression and then the size of the stack at the end is just zero. 
But let's do this example and see what happened. Let's just follow the same procedures where we're just using the information of what is at the top, because that's all we have, and what we're going to be adding, because that's like the only two pieces of information we have at any given point. So we'll add it on opening. Let's add on another opening. And we're going to see, OK, so it's not a corresponding like a opening of the same type. And this is not a closing. So we'll keep going. And uh, then we're going to be here and we're going to see, oh, we have the same type and it's a it's an opening of the same type. So in that case, we can pop this off. So we're going to not add this one, not add it. And we're going to pop this one off. And now we would have gone through this here, gone through this here, gone through this here. And then we would have added one as we iterate. And then we would have cut off when we hit the end, right? So the thing is, when you hit the end, now what's the size of your stack? We already knew that this was not balanced. So whenever we have a, a expression that is not balanced, your stack size is going to be non-zero. So it's just going to be anything greater than zero. Because if it is, it can't be negative, right? We can have negative size. And at minimum, it can be zero. But if it's zero, it's going to be balanced because that means you were able to, throughout the whole thing, find like sub subgroups that were able to be closed off and like um, like kind of eliminated because they they were able to um how do you essentially say like they were able to be removed and closed off and so because they were balanced so this was able to be balanced and once we remove this from the inside then we were able to look at these and then these could be removed because they were also balanced and that's why we ended up with, <laughs> with the stack size just being zero but meanwhile if it's not balanced you can't close everything off so you're going to end up with stuff in your stack so let's look at what they give us in this template let's go from there so they give us this line at the bottom and like i said if it's not balanced it's going to be it's going to be uh non-zero like the, the overall size so they end up giving us i believe is empty function so give me is empty i'm not going to like zoom in because it's going to show what it is but so you're going to end up returning is empty of stack but notice how one thing they pass an ampersand s the whole reason of doing that is because they're probably trying to trick you so you can lose points i don't i don't know why but they just they just do it like this and you have to since this is statically allocated you have to pass it in with an ampersand so you can like pass in a pointer um because if you just do if you just do s they will give you points off like a hundred percent they're taking points off so you're going to have to notice that type of stuff and then like catch yourself if, if you don't do it and check that. So is empty is either going to return zero if you're not empty and it's going to return one if you are empty. So for example, I, I'm not sure if they had a size function or is empty, but either way, like I'm sure you, like you can just adapt it. Um, I'm pretty sure it was, it was empty though. So if is return is if is empty is true so if it's one then we're good that means that we are balanced else we're not balanced so now let's go through the actual code that they want you to 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 write out so like i said notice how at every step we're looking backwards to see what we had so when when we were adding um this one here we were checking okay what is here is it of the same type is it a corresponding opening? It's not, so we're gonna keep one. But there's one little uh, case that you're gonna have to think about. And it's gonna be where the there's nothing in the stack at the first iteration. So then what's gonna happen is you're not gonna be able to see, oh, what was behind me? Like, like you can't peek backwards and see like, what did I just add on? Or what was like right behind me? So, you're going to want to handle the very first thing you add on a little differently. And the way you can do that is just with a simple if check, because if not, then you wouldn't have anything to look behind on. So uh, if, if is empty ampersand s, so if it's empty, we just want to add on whatever we're at. So we're going to add on push ampersand s don't forget that 
And then we're going to push on the character E of I. Else, so this is pretty much if we're not empty, we have something to look back at. So that means we just have something at the top of the stack. We're not done yet. So now in this case, this is where you're going to want to, like I said, check if you have corresponding and non-corresponding. You already know based on your base case, you have at least one thing to look back at and you're on something else that's not like that thing because you're iterating through it. So you're going to want to check back. And the way you can do that is with the peak function. The peak is just going to, it's going to look at what's at the top of the stack, but it's not going to actually remove it. It's just going to like give it to you. It's going to throw it at you and be like, okay, this is what's at it, what's at the top. And you can determine what you do with that information. So we're going to want to check. First, what are we looking at right now? So let's say we have two cases. We have the parentheses and the, the closing, like the opening parentheses, closing parentheses, opening squiggly, Closing squiggly. So if what is at the top of the stack, so P can percent S, if it's an opening, so if it's like this scenario that we had right here, where we have one of these cases where this is E of I and this is a peak of ampersand S, then in that case, that's when you're going to want to like uh close that that out so you i mean like remove it and uh and yeah just keep keep going because you can remove that uh for this balance so what's at the top is the opening and if what you're currently at is the corresponding closing so let me just let me just do the structure of that if that's the case then what you're gonna want to do is pop the element at the top of the stack so it's gonna be pop ampersand s. And you don't wanna store it, you're just throwing it out because you're not gonna do anything with that information. You only care about the final size of the stack at the end of the day, because that's gonna tell you whether or not you've been able to close off all the like sub, uh, sub uh, you know, the intervals of where something's opening and where something's closing. Else if, now we're gonna do literally the same exact thing but for the squigglies, so peak ampersand s equals equals opening squiggly and p of i equals equals closing squiggly. In that case, we're gonna wanna do the same exact thing. We're gonna pop ampersand s, we're gonna remove it out. So we, we, we just closed, if we have a case where we have the opening closing squiggly, remove them, that sub section is balanced. And there's one case. So let's just look at the structure of, of our conditions. If it's empty, meaning we're like literally at, at, at the, the very start or we're somewhere in the middle of the, of the string, but so far we've been able to balance it, then you're just going to add whatever it is that you have to be able to like uh, compare it backwards for uh, later on. Else if we have something uh, already in there, then we can check what's at the top of the stack so for these both scenarios. But let's say none of these scenarios are true. So what if we, let's say for example, we have an opening an opening uh, parenthesis at the top of the stack, but we don't have a corresponding type uh, at, the, at the current thing that we're looking at. So let's say we have a case where peak is this, but then E of I is something like this. Right, so if that's the case, or another one would be if this is the case, or another one would be if this is the case. So any of those cases where it's not what you're looking for, that, then in that case, you would still wanna push it onto the stack because you don't know if it, um, like if, if it'll still be balanced afterwards, especially in the case of the opening. So openings is just like, let's say you have something where it's like, um, it's something crazy where it's like, like this, right? Like something like this. This is balance, but 
if you just disqualify this this part and like try to return and be done with the whole function, you won't be able to know because you don't have enough information. You haven't gone through enough to be able to determine whether or not you're fully balanced or not. So that's why you're going to want to push stuff on. And even if you had something like this, which obviously is not balanced, then um, in these type of cases, then you could uh, close it out. But regardless, it'll be handled either way if you just push it on and you don't do all these these weird ifs within your uh, within your code. It just handles it implicitly. So else, if it's not one of those perfect cases that we're trying to you know handle, then in that case, you're just going to push it onto the stack. And at the end of the day, if it can balance by, by just doing this, you will end up with it empty. If it cannot balance, then you will end up with it not empty, in which case this will be zero, and zero does not equal one, which will end up returning zero. So at the end of the day, it'll still work out. So that's like the whole thought process behind just pushing no matter what. You don't have enough information to disqualify at a certain point, except in certain cases, but then you're writing too much code for no reason, you know? And you guys have 10 minutes. You guys will have like the 20 minutes I've spent on it right now, you know, so. Yeah, let's see, let's see what's up. So for loop. So if it's an opening or if it's a closing, they push it on. So the way they did it, they didn't handle if it's just empty. This will still be fine because um, when I took it, I did this and, and I have done full points on this question. So it doesn't matter. So if it's an opening, you're gonna push it on. Uh, and then else if it's a closing, you're gonna check if pop S does not equal the okay so if what you're currently looking at is a closing bracket a closing parentheses and if what's at the top of the stack is not a opening parentheses then you're going to return zero so that's one of those cases where you're just going to want to cut off early uh, and then else if e of i is equal to the closing bracket but then the what's at the top does not equal the uh, the opening bracket, then you're just going to want to return zero. So they did it a little differently. They're just kind of cutting off. Um, and based on the way that I had done it, if you were to add off those certain cases, it would have been a little longer. But um, but yeah, this is like more of a thought out approach where, you know, like it's probably Guha sitting in his office, like taking his time. He, he's told me once that he likes the most elegant way, the shortest, nicest way to write stuff. But the problem is you guys have 10 minutes, so you guys don't have time to make it look beautiful. So he does, but you don't. So that that's why like this approach looks pretty different to, to what he has here, but it still ends up working. You run it, it'll still end up working the same. Um, but this I think is like a, a little more and more logical um, when you're rushing through the test. This is uh, like, you take a little more time, you know? And then you just return empty. Uh, if it's empty, so if it's empty and you, it'll return one, and in this case, if this is empty, it returns one and one equals one, so it'll still return one. And uh, if, if it's empty is zero, it'll be zero equals one, which that's still false, so it'll still return zero. So er everything pretty much checks out. Everything is good, you just wrote it a little differently. So So yeah. That's that's how that works. And by the way, the reason he didn't check if it's empty, like the for the, for the first time, like throughout the whole the whole stream, was because he says here, pop and peak return I if the stack is empty. So that's why like he's just using that little uh, detail where if there's nothing in there at the start, it, it'll literally just be um, it, it'll be like I. So this is gonna be character I. And character I does not equal character of the opening bracket. So that's why it would return zero. But like I said, you're in the middle of the test. You don't have all these things you're thinking about. You're not like reading every minute detail like to a T, you know. So, so this approach works just as fine. So let's go on to the, to the next question. Okay, like I said, I'll do this next time. I have to brush up a little on that. Okay, they're just going to keep throwing them at me. 
Okay, another stack question. So I'll zoom in and then we can we can do that. So I'll read through a few guys. A stack is of positive integers is implemented using the struct shown below. Using the implementation of stack, write the push and peak functions. Assume that when a stack is empty, its top variable will equal negative one. So this is an array implementation to a stack. And the top variable is negative one. Sometimes it's zero. That'll uh, factor into how you code it. It'll change a little bit. But, but yeah, I'll give you guys like a, like two minutes at when the, this timer hits seven, I'll come back. So just write out the push function and peak. All right, so the quickest one to do is peak. So let's just do that. So return the value at the top of the stack if the stack is empty. So if it's empty, uh, negative one is returned. So let's see. Using this implementation, assume that the stack is empty, its top variable is equal to zero or to negative one. So the way you can tell if it's empty is based on the top variable. So we just want to do this. If s arrow in, and since it's a pointer, if top is equal to equal to negative one, then we know it's empty. So that way you can just return negative one. Otherwise, you don't have to do else here. You can just do this. Return, you're gonna do s of nodes of top. So let me just explain some of this. And th this is just it. This is all it is. So this is probably like five points, which is, yeah, that's, that's like five points right there, probably. So let me just explain this because stacks, there's two ways to implement them. There's actually like three ways. So there's a link list. That one's, um, that's, that's, that's one thing. I'm not going to explain that one right now. But when it comes to array-based implementation, there's two ways to implement it. There's top. When it's empty, it's equal to negative one. And then there's another one where the top, uh, when it's empty, is going to be equal to zero. So it changes slightly a little bit. Um, let me just show you what I mean. Whenever it's equal to negative one, so let's do this case. So let's say we just have a stack of three items. So when it's equal to negative one, this is your top right here. So when it's negative one, you cannot index, like let's say you're going to push something on. You cannot index first into top and then add something because it's literally only for the first case where that where that issue arises. So um, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to increment the variable first. So you're going to increment S of top to be zero. So this is now your top. And then you're going to want to add whatever it is onto that new index that you just incremented top. So. Now, let's say you want to add three. So let's say we're going to add three, six, one. Uh, let's say we're going to add 305. So 305. Then if you want to add something else, you increment first. This is now your top. Add in your zero. You're going to increment again first, and then you're going to add it in here. So that's five. So that's how you add your 305. But when it comes to a zero-based implementation, it's a little different. So notice how negative one, or yeah, when you start at negative one, it's gonna point to the top element. Uh, when it's at negative one, it's not pointing to like anything, which kind of makes sense. But let's say uh, right here, once you add it in, you increment negative one, it put it to zero, you added it into index zero, and then you stop. So in this implementation, when you start at negative one, top, is really pointing to what the top index is, uh, like pretty much like the last element is going is um, in the in the stack of the array. But the difference is when you go to uh, a zero base. So 
So let's start this off at zero. When you uh, when you start off at zero, so it's your top, it's gonna be pointing to the next available slot. So this is gonna be three. So in this one, you add because you know you don't have to increment zero to be a valid index. Zero is a valid index. Meanwhile, negative one isn't. So you have to increment negative one first and then you add it in. But in the case where it's zero means uh, like top equals zero means empty, you're gonna just add it in and then you're gonna increment. So notice how if we just stop right here, we just added three. Now, now we're done with our push. It represents the next available slot. So when, when you're doing um, the top variable on negative one represents the topmost element. Meanwhile, on a zero base empty, it's gonna be pointing to like the next available slot. So that's a like that's like a key difference. Okay, so now uh, there's like a minute left on the timer. So let me just close this off. So, so yeah, that, that's something to keep in mind. So since this is a negative one base, first let's let's see. So if the value is pushed onto the stack, one is going to be returned. Else, if the stack is full, you're going to return zero. So we have this defined max right here. Yeah, we have a defined max. So that's going to be the full size since that's the array size right here. So since negative one is going to point to the last element, then that means that uh, when we do negative one base, uh, this, this would be, uh, yeah, so top would just be right here. Then we're going to add it on. So this would be five. So it would be like two and then top. This is going to denote when we're full, when we're equal to max minus one. Meanwhile, when it's a, uh, a zero base, whenever you're at, at max itself, that's when you're going to be full. But in a negative one, you're, you just have to bring yourself back by one to denote where like it's full of that. So in the case of a negative one top, you're going to do if S of top equals equals max minus one, then in that case, you're just going to return zero. And then you can just stop here. So you just you handle the case that's empty, and now at the end we're just going to return one either way. So to add something on, all you're going to have to do is remember you increment first when it's a negative one base. So you can just do like like this, or I'm just going to end up doing like this. So this will increment it, and now what's going to happen is. You're going to go into the nodes and index into S of top and set it equal to value. And now you are done. So like I said, negative one, you have to increment first because then now you're going to be at zero and zero is the first like valid index you can put it at. And then you're good from there. Um, so yeah, that's a key difference when it comes to array stacks, negative one implementation or zero implementation. And you see that I was like a small little detail they just threw in there. And then also like um, the, the max, that was something you had to notice as well. But yeah, let's just, let's just compare. So they did, yeah, of course, a little differently. If S top is greater than or equal to max minus one, which like there's literally no way. If, if you have this, whenever it hits that, it's like a, a wall. It's never going to go past it. So there's like no reason to have that greater or that equal or that, yeah, that greater sign, but whatever. So it, it will it'll never go over based on this, but, you know, that's just how they have it. They're not going to take points off for that, I'm sure. So S of top. So they didn't increment first. Like they didn't literally increment S of top. They just did S of top plus one, which is exactly equivalent to this right here. I actually incremented S of top first. Um, so it changed the actual number of S of top and then I incremented. But in this one that they did, they just 
changed the the like uh, the value of s of top plus one. So they just took the value of s of top plus one and set that in there. But then they increment after. So it's the same exact thing, different order of operation. That's, that's all it is. Return one done. S of top equals negative one. Return negative one. Else return. Oh yeah, I forgot to arrow in. So that's a little better. There we go. But yes, we we had the idea right there. So that's that. So as long as you understand those basic concepts of like the array based implementation, you should be able to get it. Oh, wait, this is a Q question. What is a Q question doing in here? Oh, I select the Qs. Okay. I'll do one more stack. Okay, now I'm going to leave. Okay, you're just going to throw to me all of these, right? Great. Okay, we can do this last one for stack. Actually, let me see the time. Okay. So I'll do this one and then I'll do like two to three uh, Q questions and then I'll, we'll call it a night. So I'll zoom in and let you guys look at it. Let me see who's still in here. Oh, there's Jeremy and Anna that I was, okay. You guys are the real ones. You guys staying late. This is one of those questions that like they want you to earn it, you know. But like on the on like the last one we just did, like look at this. This is 10 points, but then this is also 10 points. Like it just it just doesn't make any sense. Actually, I don't even have to write anything. Okay, so just try to do this real quick. So we have three buckets and down here. So let's see. So suppose we want to pass cupcake to the following function. The function's output, what will it be? What will stack S1 and S2 look like when the function terminates? You may assume the stack functions are written correctly and they are designed for holding characters. Cool. So there are stacks of characters. So let's go through it. Let's just read the first parts. So they just initialize stuff, the length and everything. New string equals length plus one. So they just made a new, a copy array kind of. Then stack S1, stack S2, they initialize them. So just initialize all that stuff with the base variables. And then you have all this for loop right here. So it looks like into each stack, they're just adding this like the same string pretty much. So one string, one, one stack has cupcake, the other one has cupcake, but it's just like C, U, P, like at each node is how it's working. Okay, each location. So let's draw that out. Let's see, cupcake. And let me just copy this. Cupcake, great. Oh, wait, let me, let me draw it a little different connection. Okay, cupcake and cupcake. So let's say this is S1, let's say this is S2. And as for the string, let's just do str and uh, in case we need to, there we go. Oh, this is length of cupcake. So cupcake is seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eights for the null terminator. All right, so let's see, let's see what we got. 
So we added them both. And then now we're going to iterate. So if index is two, so if index is two, or sorry, not if index is two, okay. <laughs> if index is even, then what we're going to do, we're going to check if S1 is empty. So if stack one is empty, so is stack one empty? Or if stack one is not empty, sorry, if stack one is not empty, then we're going to send new string of I to be equal to pop of S1. Okay, so stack one is not empty. So we're going to pop off from S1. So we're going to pop off E. And we're going to place it at new string of I. And notice the index of new string is based on whatever, like, inside the for loop. So this is from inside here. So we're just building the string as we go. So yeah, we just removed that. And now we're going to be at the next iteration because this was just an if and then it's else. So now we're going to be at index one. So let me just keep track. So yeah, zero, one. So we're at one. So right now we're going to be in this else because I is not, it's not even, it's odd. So now we're going to pop off S2. So now we're going to remove it, but we're not going to do anything with it. So we just threw it away, right? We're not holding it, not storing it. And now we're going to pop again from S2 and set that equal. So now we're going to pop off K, and that's where we're going to put it. So, oh, wait, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me let me go back. I had um, I had thought this was an else right here. My bad. Uh, it's, it's not. It's going to do it. It might do it twice. Uh, let me go through that again. My bad. So, uh, okay. So let's start up again from zero. So if it's even, then if S1 is not empty, then we're going to place, okay, so that part is good. And then again, if it's not empty, then we're going to push on to S2 what we pop off from S1. So we're going to pop off from S1 K and we're gonna push it on to S2. Okay, so now, now we're good, now we're good. And uh, yeah, now we're done with that right there. So now we're gonna be at I equals one. So at I equals one, we're gonna go into this else. This is where we're gonna pop off. So we're gonna pop S2, so pop it. Then we're gonna set string of I equal to pop S2, so that's gonna be E E. Okay. Just gonna remove this. Now we're gonna be at index two. At index two, we're gonna check if S1 is empty. If it's it's not empty, so we're gonna pop off the stair. So we're gonna add it in. So A. There we go. Now if S1 is still not empty, then we're gonna push on to S2 what we uh, going to pop off from S1. So we're going to have C. We're going to push it onto here. We're going to have C. And now we're going to go on to the next iteration. So we're at index three. Now it's going to be even. So we're going to pop off what was in S2. So you pop it off, remove C. And now we're going to put on what's at the, what we pop off of S2. So we're going to pop off K. Play that there. And uh, now we're going to be at four. Four is even. So now we're going to go here again. If S1 is not empty, it's not empty. So we're just going to place, gonna pop this off, place P right here. Okay, well, good thing it didn't give us the, the answer there. So if S1 is still not empty, then we're going to push on to S2 where we can pop off from S1. So we're going to pop off U, throw it up here on top. And then now we're going to be at five. At five, we're going to be at even. So we're going to pop off from S2. So we're going to move U. And then now, so we remove that. And then now we're going to pop off again and place A right here. All right, so good so far. Then we're going to be at six. And by the way, the length of this is seven. So we're at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. After this iteration, we're, we're done like with uh, with this for loop. I'm pretty much done with the, the rest for the most part. 
because then we're going to hit seven. So six, six is even, going to go right here. And if it's not empty, if S1 is not empty, we're going to remove what's at the top. So C, and we're going to place it onto the string. And then now we're going to check if it's not empty. It is empty, so we don't do anything. We, we just uh, go on to next iteration. So now we're going to be at seven, and seven is not less than seven. Remember the length of cupcake. Cup is three, cake is four, so it's seven. So now we're done. And at the end, it says length of our new string length is equal to null terminator. So length is seven. So that's why I added that extra one uh, earlier on. And now we're going to print the string. So we should be printing E, E, A, K, P, A, C. Then uh, for the thing that they were asking, the stack one and stack two, like what's in it, we're going to have this. So S1 is going to be nothing. And this is going to be cup C. So let's see if I'm right. Yeah, there we go. So E, E, A, K, P, A, C, empty, C, P, U, C. So there we go. And let's, oh, you can look at this. So even if you did it wrong by accident, like you just flipped it, they just give you off one point. So, and if you have a small error, they'll still give you some partial. So that's good, but yeah. That one actually wasn't that bad. It's just, you have to remember every little thing, like where you are. And when I said about like earlier about drawing stuff and keeping reminders of kind of like where you are, that's why you should like draw out like zero, one, you know, and uh, as you go, so you remember where you are. And, um, and yeah, like don't erase stuff. I prefer honestly to like scribble it out and make it look messy because that way I have a track record of what I've done and where I've been kind of in a way versus if I just erase all this, like, you know, you like, what did I just have there? So, um, you know, you don't have to, scribble it out like this you can just do like this and you know you can check back if you get a little confused at any given point and then yeah all right so now we're going to move on to cues i'll do three questions i know it's late but uh, i appreciate you guys staying let's do cues all right so i'll let you guys read that one and then we'll get started All right, so I'll go ahead and start. I forgot to start the timer. Oh my God. I... Okay, I just, that was, that's a fail. Okay, I accidentally uh, clicked go. All right, so we'll just we'll just go off with this, this half of it. So a queue is in, implemented in an array. Give me like, okay, just just imagine you can't see this right here. So a queue is implemented in an array, has two attributes, front and size. Front and size uh, and the index in an array with element to be removed from the queue can be found. The queue is not empty. Front may be any valid array index from zero to 19. Size is the total number of elements currently in the queue. For efficient user resources, element cannot be added at the end of the array. Wait, cannot can be added to the queue, not just at the end of the array, but also include the indices at the beginning of the array before the front. Okay, so it's a circular queue. All right. So write a function to on queue. If the queue is already full, let me just take this here. So cool. Let me take the function. All right, so so write an on queue function for this queue. If the queue is already full, return zero and take no other action. If the queue is in full on queue. The integer item into the queue. Make the adjustments. Return one. Since it's hard coded to size twenty, you may use this value and assume the size of the array. Okay, cool. 
So we're going to uncue. So this part is going to be um, pretty important if you're not you're not feeling too hot with the circular cues, because that's typically something that people like they try not to remember, but it, like they always find it hard to remember. But uh, let me explain how it, how it works. It's actually it's actually simpler than it looks. So let's see what they what they give you first of all. So they give you the front, the size, and the values array. Okay, so I'm assuming the size is probably the number of elements in, in the queue that you have. Not This is not your size. 20 is the capacity. So typically, you have three things you care about. The size, the capacity, and the front. So size is the number of elements, the front, and then the, yeah, the capacity. So we know capacity is 20 for sure. So first things first, let's just write them down. So we can just have that there. So the thing with the circular queue is, let's say we have a simple case, two elements, so one and three, okay? So one and three. If you want it to bump queue, you can say your, your front is gonna start at zero, right? And then let's, let's just put, a, let's put an F here. So you're gonna add, let's say three, and then you have a size of one now, right? So you're going to increment your size. So size is now equal to one. So now, really, your front doesn't move except when you DQ. And in this case, we're not DQing, we're only on queuing. So we're just going to see how we're going to add stuff on. So really, what's going to end up happening is we're going to be doing F plus the size to be able to find out where we're going to add on the next element, like if we can. So we're going to, we can think of it like this. It's kind of like when you have a, a linkless queue, you're kind of like stretching it out towards the, the right. So this is going to be your F, your front, and then you have a tail and you're moving your tail, extending it downwards and, and uh, towards the right. So that's kind of like what's happening here, but it's just happening like with array indexing. So your front is anchored down unless you DQ. And um, <clears throat> so let's say you want to add on seven, then you're going to do F plus the size. And, and let's just see what happens with just this. So we have F at zero plus one. So plus one, that'll leave us right here. So that'll give us the next available index. Let's say... Um, we had a, a weird case where it was like, um, actually, no, we're, we're not there yet. So in this case, it would give you the next slot. So let's see, when I add seven, you can add seven in there. Your size is now two. But the whole point of the circular queue is that you can wrap around because there can be cases where you might have space at the front of the queue, even though it might not seem like it when you DQ. So what I mean by that, let's say hypothetically, we're going to DQ, right? So Let's we're gonna DQ, we're gonna like move this forward, right? And we're not gonna have to wrap it around or do any mod, or any stuff for this case, but um in code you would to DQ, and then you would remove this element and return it, right? You wouldn't necessarily remove it, like actually, you would just end up overriding it eventually, but let's just say um let's just put like a, a special number, negative one. Right, like let's just say it's only positive. So negative one denotes like it's empty, right? So now you can say your size is one because you just DQ. And the thing is, if you do F plus one and you index into it, what's gonna happen? You're gonna seg fault because you're gonna go out of bounds. So if you end up doing that, that's pretty bad. And uh, you probably don't wanna seg fault your code. So that's where you have to integrate. You have your F plus your size, but then you're going to want to modulate that based on whatever the uh, like whatever the table capacity is. So that's going to be in this case 20. So I'll just do cap, but it's going to be 20. So let's just go through it. Um, or actually, sorry, in, in this case, it's two. Um, but in this case that we're going to code up is 20. So in this case, this is going to be two. So we're going to do F plus size. So F is going to be uh, now it's going to be one because we moved it. So one plus the size one mod capacity, which is two. So if we do two mod two, 
since this is index zero, index one, index two, like I said, it would seg fault. So that's why you have to modulate it. And you do two mod two. And um, in this case, this is going to give you two because two goes into two like evenly. There's no remainder. So by you doing that, now you're going to wrap around and you're going to be back at the front at least. But in this case, you're going to be exactly back at the front. And now you can check, oh, is it empty? It's, it's empty, for example. And that's where you would put something in. And uh, that way you can like put whatever number you want. So you want to put like 12. You can put 12 in. And then your size, uh, it, it would have gone back up to 2 now. So now uh, at this point, if you try to add something, which is what you're going to try to figure out now, now we've, we've checked out why we need to modulate it. Uh, it's it's only for like the end case, like when you're gonna, you might seg fault if you add on. So that's why you modulate it. Now let's see how we're gonna handle a case where we're full. Um, and I guess it's gonna be a case where we're full and we're gonna have to mod it. So you're always mod it. It'll give you the, the same answer regardless if you have to or not, if you go past the capacity or not, but let's see. So let's say we wanna add something on. Let's check if we even can. So So we have two elements, right? So we're gonna do uh, the index of F, so one plus the number of elements. So that's gonna be that mod two. So we're gonna have three mod two equals equals one. So that's gonna give you index one, which would be the next available spot. But the thing is like, that's where like F is, you know? So, so you can't like go past your F. But the easier way to check about that is just, just simply check the capacity because then you're gonna have to do some, you're gonna have to do, do the mod. It's gonna be like a whole math expression where you're checking if if like that offset puts you past whatever F is after you modulate it. Um, like if this value is greater than or equal to F, then you're gonna say, no, you can't. But the easier way to do it is to just check if, if size is equal, equal to capacity, then in that case, you just won't push it on. Like you'll just return zero. So that's kind of how you can check. But I hope that made sense as to why you use this formula and why you modulate it. It's only to wrap back around because like I said, there could be an empty space at the front that you wouldn't be using otherwise if you didn't do that. So yeah, let's just, let's just go forward with it. So we have the capacity. And so if it's already full, we're gonna wanna return zero and do nothing. So, by the way, our struct has size. So we're assuming it's already like initialized. So if this Q size equals equals capacity, then you're going to want to plus return zero. Else, that means you just can't on Q. Actually, we don't even have to do anything else. We just stop right there. And then we can just return everyone. one. And then let's do all the all the addition, like how we're going to edit it. So we're going to want to go to this queue, arrow in, go to the values. Because now at this point, we've checked. If we add something on, we're good to go. Like we don't have to change anything. So we're going to want to do this queue front. Plus, since we're on Q, we're extending outwards. So we, we don't care about like moving the front. So this Q front plus this Q size. So we're not going to have any overlap. Mod capacity. And then here is where we're going to add that element. So we're just going to do item. And uh, now what you're going to want to do is just do this Q size plus plus. So you just added something on and now you're accounting for it. And that's that's literally all the code is. That's all it is right there. So you just store the capacity. Then you're just going to check if it's if the size equals the capacity. That means you're full. If not, you just take the front, add the number of elements, mod it so you can wrap back around if you have to, and then add in the item there and increment the size. So you just add something and return one. So that should be it. So let's see. 
yeah so look this whole thing was literally it's crazy but it's like five points that's almost the whole question right there one line so understanding that formula and why it is the way it is is pretty important when it comes to circular queue i feel like that's one of those things that people like lose a lot of points on because they just like didn't analyze it enough you know so this queue size equals 20 that's the capacity so same thing front plus size mod capacity equals item we did that increment return we did that so we're good on that so let's do two more And uh, we'll call it a night. Oh, well, that's perfect. DQ on the same exact thing. What are the chances? Okay. So the queue contains, it's funny because like I actually, like the, the way you get these questions, they're like randomized based on what you choose. So it like randomizes everything. And like they gave me like the exact like opposite of the one. It's funny. Okay, so write a, a function to implement a DQ functionality for the queue, ensuring no null no pointer errors occur. Your function should take in one parameter and add a pointer to the queue. Your function should return an integer that was DQ'd. If the queue is null or if there are no elements to DQ, your function should return zero. Okay, in DQ struct queue. Okay, so we'll just hop into that since it's like right along the same thing we were doing. So. All right, so let, let's just get some of the basics out. Just write it in here. Okay, so if the queue is null or if there is no element. So always like go off of those, those little ifs and just handle those like first. So at least you get those points, you know, if you don't know it or like, you know, it's, it's just good to get them up and do it. Because then you might take more time on the on the actual like the harder logic, and then you might forget to do that stuff. So yeah, I usually just knock those out the way when I'm when I was in the test and study. So if q equals no, or if there's no elements, so if there's nothing to dq, you can check that by looking at num elements. So notice we have num elements right here. We can just use that num elements for elements. Was equal to zero, then we just want to return to done. So that's a, a base case, probably like three points right there. Then now is when we're going to want to do all the other logic. So let me just draw it out again so you guys can see like the whole thought process behind that again. So DQ is a little different because now you're actually sliding down the F. So, so your front is actually moving. And um, yeah, let, let's just do a similar example. So in this case, it's two elements. This is your F. So let's say you have um, size equals two. So I'll just add in like three, four, done. So if you want to DQ, you're going to want to move your F forward. So, and this is actually one of the easier of the two functions. Some people think that the on queue is harder because it's like the mod and stuff, but you know, I. You guys, you guys saw it. Once you understand, it's not that hard. So F, we're going to want to move over, just like in the linked list queue. You're going to move it over and then remove remove this element. And uh, this is going to be your front now. So let, let's just simulate like a DQ in this case right here. So let's say you DQ. So there's nothing to do here. You just remove it. Done. So let's delete this. And then let's just move F down. So we're gonna move it down right here. So that's good. Now, let's say whatever reason you wanna add something in. So we would add a something in based on like uh, our previous function, the on queue, we modulate it. So one plus one mod two will give us back to zero and you know that we have space. So we'll put it there. So our size is still two. So it went from two, one, back up to two. Now, let's say we're going to want to uh, DQ at this point. Like, literally, the whole reason you got to modulate is just for the end of the array. So right here, if you want to DQ, 
you know, the whole thing is you move F towards the right. So if you move F towards the right, then what? Like, like now you're going to be at the end. So you'll be good in, in this, in this scenario, you'll be fine. But then when you go to use it the next time, since now you're out of bounds and you didn't modulate it, then you're going to, you're going to side fall the next time, like a, a thousand percent, you know, because now you're out of bounds for the next one. So this one's fine. It'll return four, but the next one will be messed up. So that's why you have to use modules. So let's see. We're if we're gonna um if we're gonna DQ, we're gonna want to take what's at the current point. So let's say we have V, V is our value. So we're gonna want to um they, they don't make this any thicker. Okay. So we're gonna want to do let's say like Q array of F. So this is our return value. Let's call this return. So this is our return value. And then we know we're gonna wanna increment by one either way, right? So for us to be able to move it downwards, we're gonna want to modulate because really if we remove this, so if we move this right here, this is just gonna become empty. And uh, if we move it down by one, we know that our front is actually supposed to be right here. So how can we go from here and end up back here? So this is like, it's really small, but obviously if we had a really big array, like with a million, a million things, then F, we would have to move all the way back here, but it will be the same time, same, you know, it would be just as easy. So your way to do that would simply just be to take Q, from a Q, uh, let me do QF, so QF equals, and you're gonna want to just take the value, increment it by one, and then you're gonna modulate it by the capacity. It's always a capacity, capacity is important. So you're gonna want to increment it by one. So for example, you would be, uh, you would be right here, but then you're gonna modulate it by the capacity. So you're gonna do two mod two, and that's gonna wrap you back around and set you right here. Or, sorry, there we go, F. So that's gonna be your front, which is where it should be now. So yeah, that's why I always say to like use really small examples because it'll save you time versus doing like, you know, something like this, you gotta think through it. So that's why I use a small example. So you can, if you can see it on two, the same exact logic will, it will uh, scale for three, four, five, a hundred, ten thousand, whatever. So this is pretty much how the DQ is going to work. Take the return value, uh, move it up, or or maybe modulate if you have to. If you don't have to, you'll still end up with the same number. So that's good. So let's um, let's code that out. Oh, well, I think it's uh, well, it's not showing it yet. I still have a couple minutes. So we're going to want to store return value, a U, and we have array. So Q array of U front. That's the return value. And now to DQ, U front equals U front. Plus one mod Q capacity. And um, return value. So yeah, this is the solid is right here. So yeah, we just we check if it's null. If there's zero elements DQ, so you just return zero. That's what it says here. So easy points. We take the value. You're gonna to want to return to so the value DQ at the front. Then you just move the front down by one, modulate it in case you have to wrap back around, and that is it. Oh shoot, I, I forgot to um to decrement the number of elements here. I got like that, but yeah, small three would have been just like no, it's two points, but not bad. So yeah, so they checked null, 
They just did it separately. You can do it either way. You return zero, that's good. Take the element, then Q front plus one, mod capacity, decrement it, the number of elements, and then just return value. And that's that. But yeah, as you guys see, like it's it's really short. It's really short to get 10 points. So typically they'll do like linked lists and then, then they might throw in a stack or a queue. But imagine you get like once one of those like decent, maybe even easy linked lists, 10 points, maybe five, 10 points, then, you know, a decent, probably easy. And DMAs are typically easy. So that's like 10, maybe five to 10. So let's say like 15 to 20. And then you get something like this. As long as you understand the basic logic and, and the basic math, you'll understand why, why it is and be able to knock this question out like, like nothing. So that's like another 10 points. You guys saw it on cue. It's like, look, look, it's like just four or five lines, 10 points. DQ, four or five lines, 10 points. So and you only have one of each section on, on your test. So you're not going to see like two of these, you know, back to back. So, but still, it's like 25 to 30 points that if you know like the basics, you, you can get. So, all right, let's do the last question of the night. Hopefully, it's a good one. Okay. All right. Fun. So they give you a circular array implementation of a queue implemented um, with the structure shown. So struct queue, suppose that the queue is created with capacity of five and front and number of elements to zero. Trace the status of the queue by showing the valid elements in the queue and the position of front after each of the operations below. Indicate front by making bold the elements at the front of the queue. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick screenshot of this. So then I can, okay, oh, well, I messed that up. I'm gonna take a quick screenshot of it and then I'll put it on the whiteboard quick. Okay. All right, so let's go through this. So on QQ50, so we're just tracing through, um, you know, and, and saying where we are at each point. So I'm just going to do the front in purple, and then I'll do the rest. Actually, I'll do the front in red, and then I'll do the rest in purple. So we know what the front is. So Q on Q50, first element is going to be the front. Then now this is just after statement one. So now after statement two, we're going to on Q. So this is still 50. This is going to be 34. Actually, let me use a different color. This is like blue. Yeah. This is going to be 34. Then we're going to on Q again. So on the same track, 34, then 91. Now we're going to be at this line. So we're going to be at line four. So X equals DQ. So again, for these type of things, try it out or write something so then you can see it. So X is equal to DQ of uh, Q. So after line four. So if we're going to DQ, that means we're going to remove 50 since this is the front. And then we're going to move it up by one to 34. So that means 34 is gonna become our front. 34 is our front. And then we still have 91 in there. But X is gonna be equal to 50 since you know we store it there. So it's just 50. So we have that. Now line five is where we're at. So we're just gonna on cue. So it's gonna be easy. So I'm going to do 91 and then 23. Let me add in 34. And now we're going to be at line six. So that's going to be Y. So again, let's write it out, Y. 
So y is going to be dq of q. So q, the front is 34, so let's start 34. And we're just going to remove 34. So we're just going to do uh, 91, 23. Oh, it is going to be in red. So 91. Now we're going to do statement 7. So 7, you're just going to put on 34. So you just remove it, throw it back on. So now we're going to do 34. 2391. Now we're going to be at 8 on Q15. 2334. We're going to add 15 towards the opposite end. It's going to wrap back around like circular Q. This is a circular Q, by the way. And then uh, now we're going to be at 99 nine on QX. X is 50. So it's going to be the same exact thing as this one right here, as, um, what do you call it, as 50, or as a 8, but you're just going to add on 50. So you're going to have 15, 50, 23, 34, and then 91. And now we're going to remove X, or sorry, we're going to, overwrite x to be equal to what you dq which is going to be 91. So we're going to dq 91. That means 23 is going to become our new front. So we're going to do 34, 15, 50, and that should be it. So yeah, let me just make sure. So 50, 34, 91, we're going to 50, start at x. Um, five, you're going to add something on, remove, 34 comes out. Then you're going to be at uh, line six. Yeah, okay. Seven, you're going to on cue. Yeah, everything, everything seems to check out. So seven, you're going to add it on. Eight, you're going to add it on, add on 15. Nine, you're going to add on 50. It was 50 before x was 50. Then now 10, you're just going to remove front, which is 91. Okay, yeah, that should be good. So let's see. Okay, that's good. So let's compare. So 50, 50, 34, 50, 34, 91, 34, 91. Okay, yeah, everything checks out. So yeah, that's it. And that was 10 points too. So yeah, like these Q questions, they're, they're not that bad for the most part. Um, I would even say like the, the Q linked list questions are probably easier than the, the array ones because, you know, there's no map. You just like, go and, and add a new node, add a new node, up to the end, to the end, and so on. So, so yeah, that was, um, that was the last question.